I'm Liz McGill, and I am just delighted to welcome all of you to one of my favorite events of the year, and I bet for many of you in the room, your favorite event as well. I want to offer a very special welcome to our nominees, I mean our award winners, not our nominees, our honorees. The nomination process is completed. Uh, Judge Thompson and our very own Brian Blaylock. I see Judge Thompson, but where's Brian? There you are. We gather tonight to celebrate the accomplishments of the school in public service and also two individuals who are incredibly exceptional, who have worked in law to advance the public good. These honorees are an inspiration to all of us. I think they inspire us in at least a couple of ways I want to identify. I think both of the honorees remind us that a single individual can in fact, make a real difference in the lives of others. And second, they remind me, and I suspect everyone in this room, of a solemn obligation that all of us have over the course of our lives to help others in need and to advance the public good. There are a lot of special acknowledgments uh, that I want to recognize tonight, special folks. And it, I want to start by recognizing John and Terry Levin who are here with us tonight. For those of you who are new to the school, the first years, who have wondered who the Levins of the Levin Public Service and Public Interest Center fame are, they are two extraordinary individuals who have provided wives counsel, especially when we were formulating our center, and generous support to allow Stanford to have a rare endowed center focused on supporting our community's efforts to advance public service and public interest among our students and our graduates, and an interest in the broader public services field and its development. So John and Terry, would you please stand up so we could recognize you? We are also extremely delighted to have many judges joining us tonight because of our honorees. We welcome back several alums of ours who serve on the federal bench. Judge Friedland is with us tonight, and Judge Walker, I saw you, but I didn't get to say hello yet. There you are, Judge Walker. And we have many friends from the bench who are, who are honorary members of the Stanford uh, Law School community. We, we wish they had degrees from Stanford, but, the, but they don't, but they're our friends. Uh, Justice Tino Cuellar, who certainly has close to a law degree from Stanford of the California Supreme Court. Judge Leo Dorado, who serves on the Alameda County Superior Court and worked with our honoree Brian Blaylock. I don't know where Judge Dorado is. And from the Northern District, we have Judge Lucy Coe and Judge Do John Tiger, who've joined us tonight, too. So thank you all for being here. So this wonderful event uh, didn't happen without some effort, and I want to recognize that effort. Holly Parrish and Anna Wang, in particular of the Levin Center, tirelessly worked to put this evening together, and also the student events of the last couple of days. This is a really nice moment to say thank you to everyone at the Levin Center. Holly, Anna, also Jory, Titi, and Oscar, and of course, Diane, for everything you do for the law school community, for our students and our graduates. <laughs> there are going to be special introductions of both of our honorees, and I'm, I'm not gonna take away from what I know are going to be incredible introductions of those two ex extraordinary individuals. I do want to note one attribute of both of our honorees that, that they share and that we all at Stanford really admire. In the nominations of both Judge Thompson and Brian Blaylock, something that stood out in every supporting letter to the selection committee was the commitment of both these individuals to mentoring and supporting those who wanted to pursue careers in public service, their dedication to cultivating those instincts and the, those they were advising and their full throttle when it came to supporting those individuals as they went out into the world uh, to, be, to pursue their passions. 
In testament to this, many of the, their former colleagues or their current colleagues uh, or their former clerks are with us here tonight. At law school, we, of course, are trying to educate our students to have the tools that they need to pursue their passion. And it's with incredible gratitude that we can send them to lawyers like Judge Thompson and Brian Blaylock, who helped them stay true to the path that brought them to law school in the first place. So speaking of incredible mentors and advisors, and passionate advocates for our students who want to pursue careers in public service. I'm going to turn the podium over to Diane Chin, our amazing director of the Levin Center and associate dean for public service and public interest. She's going to introduce our Miles Rubin Public Interest Alumni Award recipient. Before she comes up to the podium, let me tell you briefly the order of ceremonies. Diane is going to introduce Brian, who will make a few remarks. Then. Professor Pam Carlin will introduce Judge Thompson. The judge will make some remarks, and then we will go on our happy way feeling inspired after this evening. <laughs> Diane. I think Liz always likes it when I speak after her because I always have to actually bring the microphone down, right? That doesn't really happen. So thank you, Liz, for that lovely, those lovely welcoming remarks. I, of course, extend my welcome and thanks to the Levin family as well, to our honorees and our honored guests and everyone who's here tonight. I also wanted to offer a special greeting to two of our former public interest alumni awardees, Corrine Kendrick, who is here, and Krista Gannon also. Um, they, are, they are previous recipients of this award and we're delighted to see you here. Um, they are both amazing social justice warriors to this day. I'm also very pleased to see so many members of the Brian Blaylock fan club who are here, although I will claim to be among its founders in California at least. Um, so the Rubin Alumni Award was established by the children of Miles L. Rubin and they also select the awardee every year. As many of you know in this room, because you did your research before choosing Stanford Law School, Miles Rubin um, helped launch our loan repayment assistance program. And his children really founded this award in recognition of his dedication to the law school's graduates who use the law to promote positive social change. And each year when we get nominations, Anna Wang and I go through them and we just beam with pride um, at the ways in which the students who we were able to nurture and get to know and support at the law school have really advanced the, um, in their goals to make the world a better place. And this is certainly more than true about Mr. Brian Blaylock. So in introducing Brian to those of you who don't know him yet, I wanna highlight just a few of the many reasons that he so deserves this acknowledgement. And for the students in particular who are here, I hope you will learn some important lessons from his example. First, but not most importantly, Brian is a truly accomplished lawyer and advocate. Since founding the Youth Justice Project as a Skadden Fellow at Bay Area Legal Aid, he has become one of the most influential people in the state on how best to address the legal and services needs of foster youth and young people under 25 years old. Brian has developed and honed a breadth of skills that have allowed him to become instrumental in state and local policy making. He has rigorously learned about how the systems that can impact his client operate, examined their weaknesses, and been creative in offering solutions to improve them. Brian has diligently learned the language of lawyering and of legislating in the courts and in the Capitol. He knows how to represent clients in all manner of hearings and how to convince government actors and elected representatives that serving his client's interests are in their best interests. Professor Emeritus Michael Wald, who couldn't be here tonight but sent his warm congratulations to you, Brian, um, says that of course he's proud of everything that Brian has accomplished, but what he's most impressed by is how good a bureaucrat Brian has somehow become. <laughs> For those of you who know Michael, this is very high praise indeed. <laughs> and many of Brian's nominators noted that it is a tremendous skill to be at once an effective outside agitator and a trusted insider who is allowed to help build and implement broad-based systems and policy change. So second, and still not most importantly, 
Brian has the patience and thoughtfulness to take the long view. Of the many students I have come to know well over the years, Brian has been among the most thoughtful, both in how he approached law school and how he thought about it as a vehicle to get where he wanted to go. He knew that he would need to build something of his own, and Brian sought the classes and the network and the support outside the law that would allow him to fulfill his vision. It took diligence and an ability to outweigh his adversaries sometimes, but his persistence has paid off time and time again. And third, and now most importantly, so listen to this, Brian is a people person. And so by that I mean Brian invests in people and he treats all of us with respect, curiosity, and kindness. Brian's approach to relationships is transformational. It is not transactional. Relating effectively and compassionately to one's clients should not be a standout trait for a lawyer, but it unfortunately can be in our profession. What Brian's colleagues, interns, clerks, and comrades all remark upon is just that, however. They also talk about how he is dedicated to supporting all the young people in his life, and not just his clients, but also the young law students and lawyers who seek his guidance and training. Some of you are now fortunate that he, along with Lauren Brady, are actually teaching a class here at the law schools, and others of you have learned alongside him outside the classroom. Many of his interns and nominators spoke exactly about this. They said he embodied empowerment lawyering. He taught me how to know I was not the smartest person in the room and to respect my clients. They said his passion for the kids he helps is infectious. Bill Kosky, the head of our Youth and Education Law Project, also commented upon Brian's dedication to his clients and his understanding of the social and political structures that need to be navigated or bent to serve the communities that Brian cares about. And likely shared by any of us who had the pleasure of having Brian in class, Professor Kosky also noted, I was nominally Brian's teacher. I think we all felt like that. But I sure did learn a lot from watching him work. Plus, he's always had that sage-like beard to give him an aura of wisdom. <laughs> Grace Lee Boggs, a lifelong activist and philosopher from Detroit, died last week at the age of 100. And if you don't know who she is, when you leave tonight, don't pull out your phones, please look her up. She's worth knowing about. Grace's work spanned many movements across many decades. And because of her passing, I've been thinking actually a lot about Grace in the last week, quite a lot. And because of this dinner, I've been thinking about Brian quite a lot. Separated by gender and race, professions, decades, and geography, they nonetheless shared similarities in the ways in which they uphold the pursuit of our humanity as revelatory and revolutionary. Grace once said, you cannot change any society unless you take responsibility for it, unless you see yourself as belonging to it and responsible for changing it. And I think that that is a philosophy which my friend Brian would agree with, and indeed one which he embodies. So Brian, please come up. I have an award to present. When someone says such nice things about you, I almost feel like I should say thank you and then run for the door, <laughs> assuming that they got the wrong person. But thank you, Diane, for such a wonderful um, introduction. And it's an honor to be here and receive the Rubin Award. Um, many of my friends and mentors um, have received this award previously in the past. It's also an honor to share the stage um, and share the night with Judge Myron Thompson, who is a giant in the field Fun fact, if you Google his name, and please don't now, I will repeat what Diane said. If you Google his name, Google helpfully um, has a hint afterwards that says, Judge Myron H. Thompson, and then history maker afterwards, <laughs> which is quite impressive. Uh, 
and I won't say anything else about him. I don't want to um, spoil the introduction, but um, it's truly an honor to even be in the same conversation with him, much less uh, share a stage. Um, I want to start my very brief remarks with a quote from a Kenyan writer that I greatly admire, uh, Nguchiwo Thiongo. Um, so bear with me, there's a, there's a connection, I promise, and if there's not, um, I'm sorry. Um, so Nguchiwo Thiongo, uh, uh, the quote is from his uh, uh, fictional opus, Petals of Blood, and he says, you serve the people who struggle, or you serve those who rob the people. Um, in a situation of the robber and the robbed, in a situation in which the old man of the sea is sitting on Sinbad, there can be no neutral history in politics. If you would learn, look about you, and choose your side. This is a very important uh, quote for me uh, when I was teaching in the South Bronx. And it became a very important quote for my students in the South Bronx because they truly felt that the world was against them. Um, and I think there was some truth there. And so we spent several years figuring out the best way that we could prepare ourselves if the world was against us in that small classroom in the South Bronx. And so when I came to law school here at Stanford, I had already chosen my side. Um, and I was ready to find people here who were interested in being on my side and helping do social justice work. Um, and I say there was no end of possibilities. Uh, wonderful allies here at Stanford Law School and a wonderful history. Um, some of the folks in this room and just the people that I saw, please forgive me if I didn't notice you, but uh, Afam Oyema, um, who is doing tremendous work with the Jinko Foundation, uh, working on bringing an uh, internationally world-class hospital to Nigeria um, and just doing fantastic work there. Uh, Lauren Brady, who also happens to be my uh, co-professor at Stanford Law School right now, which we are honored to be able to, to do that class. Um, the tremendous work that she's done in education work um, with the Public Defender's Office in San Francisco, and now as she embarks on her being the national director, statewide director, grand poobah for public counsel in the education world. Um, can't be more excited about that, looking forward um, to what she's gonna be doing there. Uh, Kareen Kendrick, who was previously a, a Rubin Award, uh, and one of my mentors um, from the Prison Law Office, doing tremendous work, uh, just specifically one, just one of the things that she's doing, working on um, health reform um, in uh, juvenile halls and prisons in Arizona. Um, and then of course, Krista Gannon, uh, who started FLY, Fresh Lifelines for Youth, which I volunteered in when I was here, a tremendous program. We're so excited that it's gonna be in Alameda County shortly, and the opportunity to work with Krista and her group soon. So just an example of some of the Stanford alumni here, uh, so I was like, great, I have a team. These are the guys on my side. Uh, how awesome is that? Uh, but after, I, when I started going into my legal career, the quote started to have a different meaning for me, uh, which is very interesting um, because, uh, and part of it is I began to focus on that section uh, that says that if the, the old man of the sea is sitting on Sinbad. Because if someone is sitting on you, guess what you can't do? You can't breathe. Um, and it began to be a reminder for me, actually, some of the work that I was doing in the South Bronx, and I think 100% of the work that I'm doing now, working with young people in the Bay Area who are under 25, who simply can't breathe, uh, because so much of the weight of the systems, so much of the weight of poverty, so much of the weight of the health disparities are sitting on them, sitting on their chest, so they can't even draw a breath. And I think the work that we do as lawyers is to create that space where they can start to draw a breath, and can start thinking about the world and start thinking about the next couple of years so that then they can start making good decisions so that we can give them the best possible opportunity to work collaboratively with them um, so that they can transition successfully to adulthood. And just to give you some examples of that, a 17-year-old with high-level uh, mental health needs, um, someone who I consider, that I look up to, um, at this point had been in foster care institutionalized since three years old. Um, hadn't lived in a family-like setting or a home setting since he was three. Moved over to the delinquency system at 11. Um, and then at 17 and a half was in juvenile hall largely because they couldn't figure out where else he could go. And so the juvenile hall team came up with a plan and that plan was the moment he turned 18 to transition him to the adult jail. When really his only crime at that point was being large and African-American and scary to the juvenile hall staff. 
And we had the good fortune of having a fantastic judge, Judge Leo Dorado, um, and working with the mental health court in order to say, wait a second, that's not a good plan to move him over to jail. That just doesn't work. Um, and we're able to get together the folks with the behavioral health care, um, the judge, the foster care, probation, and work out a plan instead um, so that that young person could move to transitional housing at 17 and a half. So he got his own apartment. And then at 18, was able to move to a different transitional housing program that we found him. And now he happens to be having, his, he has his own job and his own apartment. That's a much better plan. And if no one had stopped and given him the space to breathe so that he could start working collaboratively with everyone, and more importantly, given the system to stop in order so that they could breathe and start working on these solutions, that young person would have gone directly to jail instead of having his own um, apartment. Um, uh, another example, grandmother um, who suddenly gets their grandchildren, gets the phone call late at night and says, hey, from child welfare, and says, hey, we have two of your grandkids. Will you take them in? And what does grandma always say? Yes, I love my grandkids. I'll happily take them in. Um, not perhaps pausing or perhaps pausing and having a great deal of trepidation because that means that there's a fixed income in the Section 8 housing where they're going to be taking in two brand new grandkids, which, um, if you know, kids are expensive. Um, and taking them in on a fixed income, and worse, because of the way the systems work in the state of California, this also means that these children are likely to only be placed there by the foster care system with under $600 a month total to take care of both children. Um, so us working with that system, uh, we were recently, this year, we were able to pass a, a, a law a program for the approved relative caregiver program that said, hey, that's not good enough. Think about the same thing with the kid in juvenile. That's not good enough. And now there's a new program where instead of getting $600 for both of those kids, she would actually now get $1,800 for both of those, uh, those children. Still not enough, because kids are expensive, but a step, right? Half a step. Um, another client, a youth, uh, high level mental health needs, stabilized in juvenile hall and psychotropics, right? Finally found a psychotropic that worked for him for the first time ever, allowed him to take a breath because it stabilizes mental health needs. He gets out of the hall, he goes to another county, he calls us up and he says, hey, I have five pills left and my Medi-Cal or my Medicaid, my health insurance is not active. Help me because I'm afraid of what will happen if I run out of those medications and I'm not able to access them. Um, another example, 16 and a half year old who's homeless, 15 CPS reports in the past 12 months, abused at home because she came out to her mom as being gay. Now is on the street, 16 and a half, went down to social services, applied for food stamps, applied for emergency assistance, said please help me, and they denied all of that assistance. And so is now looking at doing horrific things in order to raise money just so that she could eat. So these are the type of clients that we work with every day, and all of them, every single one of them, you can see from the description, have the system sitting on their chest. They can't even breathe. Um, I was just talking to Kareem while we were sitting there um, over at the dinner and talking about systemic advocacy and figuring out what's the best way of doing systemic advocacy so it's really driven by our clients. And one of the things I said is one of the things we struggle with is for our clients, there's so much happening that to ask them, okay, how would you change the system so it would be friendlier for you? And my kids say, what are you talking about? I just want to eat. What are you talking about? I just want somewhere to stay tonight. Like, it's not even a fair question. And so, so much of what we're doing is doing, dealing with those emergency issues and then getting to a place where we can do long-term case planning and start having those longer conversations about what, would, what it would take in order to change those systems and finding the, the, that space to breathe. Um, it'd also be really wrong for me to stand up and talk and be recognized for the work without also recognizing um, the amazing Bay Area Legal Aid team um, who works with me um, in order to do this work for these kids. I have to say, what Diane uh, did not mention is when I started the Skadden Fellowship at Bay Area Legal Aid um, and I wanted to work with kids, um, I can't say that they really knew what I was doing for about a year and a half. Um, and so it was a really testament to them when they figured out what I was doing, instead of saying, whoa, that's not what we do. Um, thanks a lot for bringing free funding to the Skadden Fellowship. We hope you have a fantastic career without us. Instead, they said, okay, how do we build this? Like, how do we build this program? And so I'm hoping you'll join me in giving a round. And if, if you guys would stand up, if you're the Bay Legal team who's being awesome, uh, stand up. If you please give me a round of applause for those guys.
Wow. That was amazing. Um, it's great to see the Levins again and to see all of you here tonight. Um, in the first century AD, Seneca observed that the good things that come from prosperity are to be hoped for, but the good things that come from adversity are to be admired. Uh, two millennia later, Judge Myron Thompson expressed a, a similar sentiment in a short video he did for the Federal Judicial Center on the pathways to becoming a judge. A life without adversity, he said, is perhaps a life without failure, but is definitely a life without success. Judge Thompson then talked about some of the adversity he faced in his life, but I think his observation describes something broader. For the past 35 years, Judge Thompson has presided with wisdom, with compassion, with creativity, and with amazing grace over cases involving the range of adversity that confronts ordinary people, and he succeeded brilliantly in realizing the promises our law has made. Now, there's several kinds of introductions I really hate. I hate introductions that begin by saying the person who's being introduced needs no introduction and then gives the introduction that was unnecessary. Uh, and Vislava Zimborska's wonderful poem, Writing a Resume, offers a warning that's probably also good for giving an introduction. Don't just grab things from a person's CV and talk about what she calls memberships in what but without why or honors but not how they were earned. So tonight I want to focus on two aspects of Judge Thompson's life that make him exactly the right choice for Stanford's National Public Service Award. The first, which actually goes to why Judge Thompson does need an introduction, although perhaps less than uh, a couple of days ago before so many of you got to meet him, uh, can be found in Judge Thompson's judicial opinions. In one recent opinion, Judge Thompson used the metaphor that district courts are what he called soldiers in the trenches carrying out orders from on high. But a century ago, in the trenches of World War I, this, I've now stopped quoting him, because uh, <laughs> the other thing I hate, even more than the introductions, are the people who, when they do quotes, go, and I quote, or <laughs> like that. So I've now stopped quoting Judge Thompson. Um, but essentially, he's the one who talked about the, the soldiers in the trenches carrying out orders from high. Now back to me. <laughs> Enough about Judge Thompson. Um, uh, but a century ago, in the trenches of World War I, we learned that while generals can lay out grand plans based on sweeping visions, the hard work of actually moving forward is done by those soldiers in the trenches. And those foot soldiers need to be introduced to law students because you seldom actually encounter directly the work product of district judges in case books and in classrooms. Now, Judge Thompson's opinions, masterful though they are, show us why that is. Uh, his opinions have been instrumental in reforming Alabama's medieval mental health and mental retardation system, in declaring that the Eighth Amendment prohibits using hitching posts to subject prisoners to pain and humiliation, in bringing common sense to sentencing individuals convicted of federal crimes, in overseeing fundamental changes to how county commissions, school boards, and city councils are elected, in ensuring the integration of the Alabama State Police, in requiring the state to treat gay and lesbian student groups equally with all other student groups, in finding that the placement of a huge monolith bearing the Ten Commandments in the center of the state Supreme Court building violated the Establishment Clause, and in striking down Alabama's draconian restrictions on abortion. But unlike appellate opinions, these opinions don't shine because they crystallize the law in a single phrase. Unlike Judge Posner or Justice Cardozo or Justice Jackson or Chief Justice Marshall, it's hard to capture the essence of any of his opinions in an aphorism. But that really is the point. As a soldier in the judicial trenches, what characterizes Judge Thompson's opinions is the accumulation of telling detail and the careful exegesis of existing doctrine in this course of doing justice for the parties in front of him. Of course you should read his celebrated opinions in cases like Wyatt and Dillard and Hope and Glassroth and in Planned Parenthood against the aptly named Strange. Uh, but I think you would learn a tremendous amount from learning at cases that probably didn't even make the Montgomery Advertiser, let alone the New York Times, like his sentencing opinions in United States against Rodriguez or United States against Reyes Campos, 
to see what a judge who is careful in every sense of the word can accomplish. Judge Thompson, in the thousands of cases he has decided, has delivered to millions of people what the Supreme Court promises in the pediment over the Supreme Court building, that is, equal justice under law. Now, the second reason why Judge Thompson is such a perfect choice for the Public Service Award is something that cuts a little closer to home. It's what Judge Thompson has done for the profession. Through the work his law clerks have gone on to do, Judge Thompson has been a force multiplier for public service. Last year, one of his clerks received the highest award given by the Department of Justice to a career lawyer. In a different year, Judge Thompson was the only judge in the history of American law and the history of the Skadden program to get all of his clerks awarded Skadden fellowships at the same time. And one of those, I'm delighted to say, was David Sapp, a 2012 recipient of the Miles Rubin Award. His Stanford clerks and his other clerks, I have to admit that occasionally he, you know, digs deep and goes elsewhere. Um, <laughs> but his Stanford clerks um, are a living illustration of the breadth of public interest practice. To name just a couple, there's Nana Gupta, who's at the ACLU, and Orion Denjuma at the ACLU. There's Alexa Van Brunt, who runs a public interest law clinic. There's David Owens, who works at a public interest law firm. There's Dan Lennertz, who's an assistant US attorney. There's Danielle Goldstein, who works in the Santa Clara County Counsel's Office. And there's Joe Gaeta, uh, who works for Senator Sheldon Whitehouse as a legislative counsel. The public interest bar across the United States is positively marbled like a good steak with former MHT clerks. They, too, are trench soldier, soldiers in the campaign to realize the promises of the Constitution. And they, like Judge Thompson's opinions, will carry forward. I've now known Judge Myron Thompson for more than half of my life because the first case I worked on that was a major case when I started practice was in front of him. I spent my 30th birthday with him during a trial in Montgomery, or more to the point, I spent my 30th birthday going to a McDonald's down the road uh, from the hotel while trying a case uh, in front of Judge Thompson in Montgomery. I've argued two cases before the Supreme Court that began in his courtroom. In all that time, he's challenged me, he's inspired me, he's made me think critically about the law and its possibilities, and I know that he will do the same for you. That's why it's such an honor for me to introduce him to you tonight, Judge Thompson. faculty and students. Uh, I think I will just steal Mr. Blaylock, take him back to Alabama, and then say goodbye. <laughs> uh, that's a re remarkable man. Um, thank you for having me here and, and for honoring me. Uh, thank you for those wonderful remarks. Pam, but I'm not going to rule in your favor anyway. <laughs> uh, this honor coincides with 35 years for me on the bench. Um, I've been a federal judge now for more than half my life. Uh, and in fact, for all but eight of my working years, I've been a federal judge. All I know is judging. Uh, these years have been challenging, but uh, all I did was really do my job. I'm not sure that one should receive an award for just doing his or her job. However, I must acknowledge that if I did the job well, um, an essential factor uh, in that was the help that I received from this institution, from this law school, from this faculty, and especially from these students. I therefore see this award as really a symbol of a symbiotic relationship, an acknowledgement of that relationship, and a relationship that actually goes back over 50 years. And I'll explain why. 
Um, you have to imagine that it's in the early 1960s, obviously before most of you were born. In the early part of the 1960s, you had the Freedom Rides uh, in Alabama. Basically, these were young students, many law students, who came to Alabama to racially integrate the transportation system. These rides resulted in these students being literally beaten, their buses burned, and yet they achieved their goal. You also had, during this period, the Selma to Montgomery March. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Selma. But again, you had actually students, law students, students like you, who came to Alabama and sought to vindicate the rights of every American to vote. They left the comfort of their schools, these kids. They left the comfort of their dorms, their libraries. And they marched down there with people who, for the most part, did not even look like them. Some of these students remained after these rides and after these marches to stay down there and work with the people down there in some summer programs, programs to teach minority students, uh, to help these students uh, know what the broader world was like, what a world could be like without discrimination. Two of those law students worked in a program in which I was one of those minority students. I was 15 at the time. I befriended those two law students. They took me on a tour of the entire United States looking at colleges. As a result of my friendship, I was able to attend one of those colleges, that is one of the colleges one of those students was attending, and eventually went to the law school that one of those uh, students had attended. The import of this is that law students like you changed my life. And the spirit that animated those kids back in the 60s is the same spirit that should animate you as you go out into the world and try to do public service here in 2015, uh, 2016, and 2017. It's the same spirit that has animated students who have come to Montgomery to work from me as law clerks. It's the same spirit who, that has animated other Stanford students to come to Montgomery and work in various public organizations. It was the spirit of the Freedom Riders. It's the same spirit that lives on today in you. In this sense, you students here who are members of the public service community, you're nothing more than modern day Freedom Riders. You may not ride buses. You ride airplanes, you ride trains, you ride, you drive cars. But your goal is the same, freedom, in all its dimensions, politically, economically, socially. It must also be remembered that these freedom riders came from all walks of life. They were entrepreneurs, private entrepreneurs, they were teachers, uh, they were ministers, uh, they were engineers, you name it. They came from all walks of life. And when they finished the marches and then when they finished riding on the buses, they went back to their private lives as private entrepreneurs, teachers, and whatever. Therefore, the fact that You might work in a law firm 
is not necessarily inconsistent with your full commitment to public service in the public sector. The two are not mutually exclusive. But I do have one peeve about that, and I'm going to share it with you. you know, quite often I'm called upon to review applications for judicial positions. And one of the questions will be, what have you done to serve the public interest? And usually I'll look down there and I'll see an answer that will say something like this. You know, 30 years ago, I helped this black guy in a criminal case get a lighter sentence. I call that the one potato answer. When I was a high school student, I read a lot. And I used to like to read really fat books because I had so much time on my hands. And the fatter the book, the more enjoyable it was. And you know, I, 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 I can't read Moby Dick now, but I read it back then. And my favorite author was the fattest book writer of all times, Dostoevsky. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and, and, and my favorite book was the fattest of his books, The Brothers Karamazov. But there was, there was an allegory in there, and I hope there are no Dostoevsky experts in this room, because I know I'm just going to botch this. But there's an allegory in there, and I call it the potato. And it goes like this. Uh, a woman who has just spent her whole life being mean is in hell. She's gone to hell. And there's an angel flying over her. And he sees her, and he feels sorry for her. And uh, he flies down to her and he says, can't you tell me one thing that you did good? And the woman thinks and she thinks and she thinks. And finally she says, yes, once I gave a potato to a beggar. So the angel says, okay, I'm going to go get that potato. So he flies away and then he comes back with the potato and he puts the potato above the woman and uh, he says, now grab hold of the potato, and I will lift you out of hell. And the woman grabs hold of the potato. And he's lifting her out of hell. And, you know, first he lifts her top part of her body, and then he lifts the bottom part. And only her feet are sort of hanging there. And then everybody else in hell sees her being lifted out, and they all grab her feet so that they can be lifted out as well. And the woman looks up at the angel and then she looks down at all these people grabbing at her feet, and she says, that's my potato. That's my potato. And the potato goes immediately breaks, and she falls back into hell. Well, I see applications where people say, 30 years ago, I did this particular little bit of public service. To me, that's one potato. It's not going to lift you out of hell into uh, this prestigious position. To me, one potato is not a commitment. A bushel is not a commitment. A commitment is lifetime. And so when I, you know, when I, when I read those applications, sometimes I want to say, um, you know, it's better almost to leave it out that, that, you, that you did this uh, 30 years ago. But uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, people con continue to do it. And unfortunately, uh, more unfortunately, some judges buy one potato. Also, it's important to remember that these freedom riders also committed their personal lives in the sense that they subjected their own personal beings to violence. And the import of that is that Quite often, what we do in our private lives can reflect just as much or just as much a commitment to public service as to what we do in our public lives. When my wife and I reached the age of 50, and we thought of, and as I was approaching senior status, we thought about taking off for Italy or South America or Africa, and my sort of spending my remaining years retired. Instead, we adopted two foster kids in our old age. Now, raising kids is a challenge. 
raising two kids who already have one, if not two strikes against them, is an incredible challenge. But the reward is absolutely amazing. Just two months ago, one of my sons said to me, Dad, and by the way, he'd gotten into a little trouble. He said to me, Dad, thanks for not giving up on me. This award means a lot to me, but I have to be candid. It pales in comparison to Dad, thanks for not giving up on me. Whether you're working for an organization that's dedicated solely to the rendering of public service, or whether you're working for a law firm but you've dedicated your life to public service, or whether in the privacy of your own home you've made a commitment to helping someone who's less unfortunate than you, that's the spirit of what I consider the Freedom Riders. Before I end, I, I want to mention one other little story. I, my stepfather was a minister. He was an African Methodist Episcopal Zion minister. That's an AME Zion minister. And uh, I was responsible for opening and closing the church on Sunday mornings and so forth. And he would always, and well, not always, but sometimes he would say in his sermons, you know, that if he did right, you would go to heaven and you would get a crown. And uh, I can't say I bought into that. But assuming there is a God, and assuming, you know, there is heaven, and I'm speaking like a lawyer, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> assuming that uh, uh, there is a crown awaiting you, and even more and, uh, amazingly, assuming that uh, someone like me more through mercy than for merit, let me assure you, were to get a crown after I died, one of the jewels in that crown would be this. After uh, um, uh, I became chief judge of the court, one of my responsibilities was to build a new courthouse. And one of the, uh, well, the plans for the courthouse required the destruction of a bus station right next to that, to the old courthouse. Two law clerks, one of them being mine, came to me, sat down in front of me and said, Judge, you cannot destroy this bus station. I said, why not? It's, it's an eyesore. In fact, it's even dangerous because some of the faculty, some of the uh, employees of the courthouse uh, leaving at night had been accosted by drug dealers uh, at the bus station. And they said, but judge, this is where the beatings took place, of, uh, where the Freedom Riders were so savagely beaten, where they were attacked by the KKK, and where the uh, Alabama police force stood by and watched and did nothing. They said, Judge, how can you do this and allow what these people did, not the KKK members, but the Freedom Riders, to just pass away with no acknowledgement? So after the two law clerks left, and I'm not making this up, this was two law clerks. After the two law clerks left, I said, you know, they're right. I can't let this bus station be destroyed. And so I went to battle with the federal government to get enough money, not only to build our new courthouse, but additional money for the restoration of the bus station and to make it into a museum. Quite often when kids come to the, our courthouse to walk through it, I'll say, I want you to go see the museum next door. But when you see it, I want you to remember that it's not just a history lesson, it's a challenge. Ask yourself when you see this museum, would you, knowing yourself, 
had gotten on one of those buses back in 1960. Would you, knowing yourself, have traveled to Montgomery, Alabama to vindicate the rights of people you did not know? That's the challenge I pose to you as you go to that museum. Here today, I don't know whether my speech has been particularly inspiring, but I please ask you, do not consider it motivational. Instead, consider it a challenge. Ask yourself, as you sit here today, would you go to Montgomery, Alabama, knowing yourself, and ride those buses knowing the danger that you would confront? Would you, knowing what had happened in Selma and all the people who had been beaten, march from Selma to Montgomery? And if your answer is that you would not do that, I would ask, why not? Thank you.